Lord, we thank you for your presence. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. This is your service. These are your words. These are your people. Lord, we pour ourselves out at your feet and we say, Lord, we are here. We will do whatever you want us to do. Lord, be a mouthpiece that speaks through us in our obedience to bless every soul in this place, every soul online that hears your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrea. So as I said, we are going to be talking about trauma today. And so first I wanted to just define what that is we're talking about and then kind of give you a little bit of an overview of where we're going to go with this. So the definition of trauma is that it's a response to a deeply disturbing or distressing event. A response to a deeply disturbing or distressing event. So notice that the trauma is not the event itself. The trauma is the response to the event because you and I could experience the same thing and I might not be traumatized by that. You might be traumatized by it. It's a very individual thing and it's all about your response to that event. How does it affect you? And when it affects you, it can very often affect you for the rest of your life, and very often you don't even realize that. Part of the reason you may not realize that is that you believe you've covered it up. You believe you've set it aside. You believe you've hidden that, and you tried to hide it from everybody else in your life. You've probably hidden it from yourself, and because of that, you may not even realize how that trauma continues to affect you today. And so that's what we're talking about. We may not hear about trauma frequently in churches. Somebody said to me this morning, this isn't something we often talk about in church, which is a bit of a shame because many of you have very likely experienced trauma in your life, true trauma. Every one of you, I would venture to say, has experienced some sort of trial some challenge, some tribulation, some struggle in your life that very likely still affects you today. You might be in the middle of it today. And our prayer, my prayer and Andrea's prayer is just that through this experience today that we're going to share here, that somebody, hopefully even more than one, to be honest is what we're praying for, that somebody will experience the love of God in such a way that you will be able to face your trauma, trials, and tribulations that you've experienced in your life, and you'll be able to face it in a new way such that you will gain a new healing, a new sense of freedom that you've never had before. That's our, that's our prayer for today. Many of you have likely experienced some traumatic experiences but you've all experienced trials and tribulations. When we talk about trauma, there are technically three kinds of trauma. The first type is acute, and acute just means it happened one time. It's something that happened in your life one time, but it continues to affect you. Now, even an acute trauma, a one-time event, could be just a matter of seconds, can affect you for the rest of your life and in ways that you might not even realize continues to affect you. There are lots of neurological reasons for that. So this, today, I'm a scientist, so this is gonna be really a combination of psychological stuff and spiritual stuff because to me they go hand in hand. But the truth is that even a trauma, a traumatic event that lasted only seconds in your life can change the way your brain is wired and that's why it continues to affect you. So an acute trauma is a one-time event. Maybe you were in a horrible car accident, okay? That means that riding in a car might never be the same for you again. You might not ever put yourself in a position to feel so powerless, right? You might not ever be a passenger in a vehicle again because of that one event that might have taken a few seconds of your life. That's how significant trauma could be. It could be a tornado. For Andrea, it was a tornado. When we met, if it even started raining, she would start to panic. She would have to have the weather channel on. She'd have to be watching the weather channel. And I'd be saying, what's the issue? It's just raining. But she experienced a tornado in her life. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we, it was Christmas. More, it was Christmas Eve morning, and so it caught everybody off guard. Five in the morning, everybody was asleep. So you're vulnerable because you're not even conscious. And it came down, 
and it hit my grandfather's barn. It flattened it. It started to hit my aunt's house, which I was in. All I could do was scream, Jesus, that's all I had in me. That's all I had. Hey, that's enough. Yes. That is enough right there, let me tell you. But that's all I could do was just scream his name. And I could hear the destruction. You could hear stuff being ripped. You could hear stuff being thrown and being banged around. And after it passed, I walked on the porch, saw a metal beam through my aunt's car. I look over to where my mother was staying at my grandfather's house. Roof was blown off. Come to find out she watched the roof be blown off. So there were things, that, more more details, but we all thought we were going to die. It's not like, well, there's one in Dothan. No, it was on us. It was on us. My mother ended up with a few injuries. So it was very real. It wasn't some irrational fear. Oh, a shark's going to get me on land. It wasn't irrational. This was really happening. And so, like he said, I would panic. I mean, you can ask our girls. Even today, the panic and the fear does not consume me to the point that I am so paralyzed. I am just shaking and sweating and crying and, and just bumbling around. But I do still turn that weather channel on. I still use the wisdom that I learned from the situation. But it does not define and own me anymore. So that was an event that took literally minutes of her life, but it continued to affect her for many years afterwards. That's an acute trauma, right? Doesn't happen often, but it only has to happen once to impact your life in some way and make you realize how much you need Jesus. The other kind of trauma is called chronic trauma. That's when, when we have a long-term response from prolonged or repeated events of the same type. So if I experienced bullying growing up, right? It's the same type, but it's repeated. It wasn't just one event. It was repeated events of bullying, maybe repeated abuse in the home. Maybe I grew up in an unsafe environment. So I'm traumatized from a long-term repeated event that has happened numerous times in my life. That's called chronic trauma. And then there's complex trauma. Most of my patients have experienced complex trauma, which just means multiple traumatic experiences have happened in their lives. Multiple abuses or other experiences, such as being in combat. When I do an assessment of post-traumatic stress disorder in my patients, I have to ask them, well, what stood out to you about combat? And very often they say, just being in combat because every day was a new traumatic event. Every moment of being there was a life-threatening experience. So there may not be one that stood out. It was complex trauma. It was the whole experience that might have lasted a year or more. It changes you. We can't compare our traumas, though, right? So you could say, well, someone's been in combat. They had bullets, right, shooting, uh, you know, alongside their head. That's... That's nothing like what I experienced as a child, maybe being abused. We can't compare our traumas because the, the important thing about the trauma is that remember, it's not the event itself, it's the effect on you, right? Only you know how that affected you, and that's all that matters. You can't look around to other people and somehow judge your trauma as being less significant. It's significant because it impacts your life. But we're all wounded in some way, as I said. So you may hear those stories and you may say, well, nothing really traumatic then happened in my life. And that's why we want to make sure that you realize we're not just talking about necessarily those events. For some of you, we're talking about something even deeper that left a deeper wound. Really, we're talking about those wounds that nobody sees right? It's not obvious. You may do a fantastic job of covering it up. You might meet everybody you know with a big smile on your face, and everybody in your life thinks you've got it all together, but deep down, you're absolutely wounded, and that's what we're going to talk about today, how those wounds affect you, and most importantly, how we can heal from those wounds, and the fact that we can only heal from those wounds with God's help. So in talking about this today, we've come up with three P's that can access God's healing power. Very often when a friend is suffering, especially if it's somebody here in the church, some well-meaning person 
in an attempt to help them, will throw out their Romans 8.28, right? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So we might throw that out there as an attempt to try to help them through it, right? Hey, I'm really struggling. I'm really hurt. I'm really, I'm really feeling damaged. I'm really anxious. I'm very depressed. Oh, well, you know, we know that in all things God works for the good. That's maybe not going to be so helpful, right? It's well-meaning. We're doing what we can. Not only that, it's absolutely truth. It's scripture. It's Bible, right? It's a powerful, life-changing truth, but it may not feel helpful when you're still reeling because of what happened, when you're overwhelmed with anxiety, when you feel numb, ashamed, guilty. So today we walk into this prayerfully and we describe a three-part process, a process to get to the point that Romans 8.28 really means something to you, that you're really able to take that in and soothe your soul with the knowledge that God will turn all things for good in your life if you give him that opportunity, all right? So in this three-part process, the first part is to process your pain. Process your pain. That means face it. It means work through it. And in order to process it, we need to first acknowledge that it's there. So some of you might still be saying, well, I'm not so sure, and that's okay. It may take you a while to really recognize and acknowledge that it's even there, that it's operating in your life, that it's affecting you on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, that it affects your relationships, it affects how you deal with the stresses and, and difficulties and challenges that come up in your life. You may not be aware of it, so the first thing is to just recognize that it's there. For some of you, something has already popped to mind right off the bat. You said, yep, that certainly was traumatic for me, but I shoved it under the rug because that's what we do, right? It's a natural human response. It's painful. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to focus on it, so we try to cover it up. It makes perfect sense, but the problem is that it's still there, and it doesn't get any better. And we're going to talk more about that today. The second thing we're going to talk about is prayerfully taking it to God because that's the most important part of this process. Once I recognize that it's there, I acknowledge it. Once I process it, I'm able to think about it and share about it, maybe talk about it with other believers. Once I can really process it, then I need to take it prayerfully to God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8, it says that Paul three times I took it to God and prayed and pleaded for help. That's Paul. Now, the Bible scholars believe that when he says three times, he's not saying I prayed three times about this major trauma in my life. He's saying through three seasons of ongoing prayer. Right? So, in other words, we may need to keep coming to God. When I say prayerfully take it to God, I'm not talking about one time. I'm talking about pray about it, pray about it, pray about it, pray about it. Pray for him to move into your life and to help you find healing over that trauma. And when you do that, you need to be honest with him, right? And he can take it, right? So some days you're going to say, God, where are you? Why aren't you helping me with this? Some days you might even say, God, why did you even allow this to happen to me? I didn't deserve this. This isn't fair. How could you allow this to happen to me, God? And when you do that, you know what? He's big enough. He can take it. And it's all part of the process that you have to go through. Prayerfully take it to God. Because he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul said, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knew that sometimes we have to just let our guard down. We have to stop trying to act like we're strong enough to deal with it ourselves because we're not. And that's such an important moment in our lives when we realize Lord, I can't do this. I can't do this. But with you, all things are possible, and I need you to, to join me in this battle. Right? David, David, when he faced his Goliath, he didn't do it because he was big and strong. He didn't know that he could take Goliath down because he was big and strong. He knew he could take Goliath down because he knew he had God with him. Right? And you may not have a Goliath in your life, but I guarantee you, you have your own giants. 
And you can take those giants down if you have God with you. You just have to know that you have God with you. In fact, one of the purposes of our pain is to bring us closer to God, right? So one of the great values of whatever you have gone through, though it might not have felt like it had any value at the time, you can decide today that it has value in my life because that's the thing that's bringing me closer to God. And then third, we're going to pursue purpose in our trauma. So I just said that's one of the purposes, but we're going to find the purpose. We're going to ring this thing of all the purpose that we can find. We're going to see how can I turn this to good with God's help. And it's only with God's help, right? So if you're in the middle of it now, you might say, well, hey, Dr. Katz, there's no good that could ever come out of this. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. It wasn't okay. And I understand all that. But even in the face of all that, God can turn it to your good. And we're going to talk about how he can do that. We can have purpose in the pain and maybe one day even comfort others from that pain that we have experienced. You may not be ready yet, but there will come a day when you're ready. So the first step of the process is to process the pain. And in order to process it, as I said, we first need to acknowledge that it's there. That's so important. I was thinking about, I woke, I, I tossed and turned all night, and the Lord was, was giving me so much that he wanted me to share with you today, none of which is in my notes because he gave it to me all night. But one of the things that the Lord said to me last night, Miss Andrea doesn't even know this, he said, there's a room in the house that's got a locked door. There's a room in the house that's got a locked door. And I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about today. That's exactly it. Because your life is a house, right? You want to invite God into your house, but your house has a room with a locked door, doesn't it? That's where you put that trauma. It happened, you don't want to face it, so you lock that door. You say, I'm never going in that room. But now I still want to invite God into my house, right? Miss uh, Amelia Duran is in real estate now, and that's the other thing that came to me is that, you know what, in real estate, I don't know if it's a law or a rule or just an ethical guideline, but I know that when you sell somebody a house, you're supposed to tell them everything about the house, right? You're supposed to, even supposed to tell them what's wrong with it, right? Well, imagine if somebody came into the house and they said, well, what is that smell? That smell's coming from that room over there. Don't worry about it. That door has been locked for a long time. We don't ever go in that room, right? Well, that's kind of what we're doing. When we invite God into our house and there's a room that's got something that's starting to smell because something died in that room, right? Something died in that room, that room in the house of your life and you locked the door. And how is that gonna work out? It's not because it's smelling up the whole house, right? You may not even notice the smell anymore because you've spent so much time, it's your house. But when someone comes in, they can smell it. And that's exactly what happens in our lives. When we try to lock away our trauma, we don't face it, we don't acknowledge it, we don't process it, we don't talk about it to anybody very often, right? Maybe you've not talked about it to anybody in your life. It starts to stink, right? It doesn't heal. It's not a wound that heals. Time does not heal all wounds. I'm going to talk about some of the myths that get us all messed up. And that's one of the myths that gets us messed up, right? We tell ourselves, well, time will heal all wounds. I'll keep that door locked. And over time, I won't even think about it anymore. It won't affect me. But it doesn't work that way. Because what happens is the wound gets infected. And when you have an infection, that, that impacts the entire body. Right? And that's what's happening with that trauma in your life. That's why I really want you to consider, is there some trial or tribulation? Is there some unmet need that I've had in my life that might be still affecting me today? So when I talk about an unmet need, what I'm talking about is what I call soul wounds. 
Soul wounds are things that we're frequently unaware of. That we, we don't even know that they exist most often, right? So if you're one of those folks that you say, well, I never really had anything like that happen. I never really had something traumatic like what Miss Andrea described. I haven't been in a tornado. Nothing really life-threatening happened in my life. I guarantee you have had soul wounds in your life. You've been hurt. That's all I'm saying. You've been hurt, and you tried to cover up that hurt, but covering it up doesn't do it. The only thing that does it is the power of God coming into our lives and helping us to process it and face it. When I was growing up, and I've talked to the, the men's group about this several times. If you talk to any of the men in here that come to men's group, they can tell you exactly what my soul wounds are because I've shared it with them. Sharing it with them is part of the process of processing it, right? I could have recognized it and just kept it to myself, and what I would be doing is still shoving it under the rug, but I didn't. I took the risk. I took the chance. I stepped outside of the boat like Peter did, and I shared with them about my soul wounds, and what I told them was, look, I couldn't get any praise or recognition when I was growing up. I love my parents dearly. They're both past now. They were great parents. They certainly did the best they could. They were not abusive. We were not um, neglected in any way. But I could not get any praise or recognition for whatever reason, whatever intergenerational, cross-generational reason. They had decided that it didn't matter what I could come to them with. Hey, I got straight A's. Hey, I got this award, that award nothing. I would not get praise or recognition from either of my parents. And I needed that. And so you might say, well, that's no big deal. And maybe it would have been no big deal, except that what happens is the enemy takes advantage of those moments. Every single time you have one of those moments that your needs are not met, the enemy takes advantage of it, right? So what happened in my life was the enemy would say, see, it's because you're not enough. You're not enough. You don't deserve praise or recognition. All right, somebody said something nice about you. Somebody gave you some award. You fooled them. That's all. You fooled them. Your parents really know you, and they know that you're not enough. You're not good enough. You're never going to be good enough. The enemy loves to take that opportunity to speak into your brain, right? And even that would be no big deal if you could just dismiss that. But what happens is, what happened with me was that I made agreements with the lies of the enemy. In other words, I said, you know what, you're probably right. You're probably right. And every time the enemy said, you're not enough, you're not competent enough, you're not smart enough, it doesn't matter what people think about you, they're wrong, they don't see the real you. If they saw the real you, they would leave, they would realize that they've had you wrong this whole time. Deep down, you know you're not enough. And more and more I said, you know what, I'm sure you're right. But even though I think that you're right, I know that you're right. I believe you, I've, I've made agreements with you on that, and, but I'm gonna try to cover that up. Of course, I can't let anybody see that, but that's what's deep down inside. That's what I'm talking about with soul wounds, and I only share that with you because I'm quite certain that you have all had some soul wounds in your life, right? I'm quite certain that everybody in here has had some moment when you had an unmet need. And again, it doesn't mean that your parents weren't wonderful it means that they were human, right? So that time that you reached for an embrace from your dad, but he was distracted and he turned away, maybe the enemy took that opportunity to say, it's because you're not lovable, right? You're, you don't really deserve his love. You don't really deserve love at all. You think that you're lovable. You think you're going to have a spouse someday and a happy family and everybody's going to love you, but he turned away because you're not lovable. And at some point, you make agreements with those lies of the enemy. We'll talk more about this because it's important that you know that what the enemy is telling you about yourself is lies. He's the king of lies, isn't he? Because the truth is, you are a child of God and are worthy of the blood of Christ. Whew, 
That's all you need to know right there. That says it all. You are worthy of the blood of Christ, which means that anything that the enemy has fed you about not being enough, not being good enough, not being lovable enough, was a flat-out lie. And so processing it is first recognizing the truth of that. Sometimes we can try to cover up our past pain with that which we can control, because that all fell outside our control. So we try to say, okay, well, hey, if deep down I know I'm not good enough, then what I'm going to make sure I do is control everything I do, try to be better than everybody, better than I ever could, better than anybody could expect. And maybe that will cover up that deep down pain, right? So we try to control achievement, performance, productivity. We try to just show the world that we're good enough because deep down we don't feel like we are. We still believe we're damaged. At some point, those coping mechanisms cannot mask the hurt we're feeling deep inside anymore. Once we recognize it and admit it to ourselves, God will place others in our lives to process it with. Because you know what? We don't heal in isolation. So when I say process it, I'm including sharing it with other people. When I shared that with the men's group, and I continue to share it with the men's group, healing is coming from that, and I know that it's because God placed those men in my life. He said, here are some men you can trust. Here are some people in your life you can trust to share that with. That pain that you have never faced, never talked about, never even recognized within yourself before, now you can share that, and, and you can trust them with it. And that's been absolutely true, and it's been absolutely healing. And that's what you need to do. Once you recognize it, you acknowledge it, you've processed it within your own mind through prayer, meditation, deep thought about the issues, you need to share that. Before I ever shared it with the men's group, I had, I had a day at the office where I had no patience. And I actually spent the day just meditating on my childhood just praying about my childhood, just asking God, what was it? Where did I get these screwed up ideas? What, what allowed the enemy to come into my life with these lies that I made agreements with? And in that day, he showed me scenes that I thought I, I had no memory of. They were from 50, 55 years ago sometimes in my life, things that I had no memory of until that moment, and he showed me those scenes, and, and it was like he was saying, see, remember when that happened? That was one of the moments that the enemy came in and said, see, you're not deserving. See, you're not good enough. And so if you're sitting there saying, well, I'm not really sure about my own soul wounds, I would encourage you to spend some time in meditation and in prayer and just ask the Lord to show you where did these lies come into my life? Because once you can see where they came in, it gives you some sense of control over them, and, and it makes it easier for you to share them with other people. This has become a big part of your story, so it's a part of your story that you need to become familiar with, right? We're all living a life where we're just telling a story. We have Act 1, we have Act 2, and I'm here to tell you that no matter what happened in Act 1 and Act 2, you're writing your story, and you can start writing Act 3 today. And today you can say, I'm no longer going to be held back or limited or affected in any negative way by whatever has happened in Act 1 and Act 2. But if I'm going to get to the point in Act 3 that I'm going to turn this thing around and make a happy ending for myself in this story... I'm going to need God's help to do that. I'm going to need God to help me write the rest of this story. So that's why it's important to face your soul wounds moving forward. Anything to add on that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not really the talker in this marriage, believe it or not. I'm just talking a lot today. But I so appreciate my wonderful wife for allowing me to do that. Those of you that know her know that she is a powerful woman of God, a powerful prayer warrior. So I was talking to a student about how therapeutic and freeing it is to talk about our pain. And she said, 
when we're finally able to talk about that stuff, instead of keeping it secret, the enemy loses his power. Best thing that student ever said. And she was exactly right. And that's what it's all about. We have to put the enemy in a situation where he loses his power, and we do that by talking about it. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, experienced all types of trauma, and God brought him to a stronger place based on what he'd been through. After his road to Damascus experience, he endured prolific abuse and ongoing severe trauma and spent much of his life running from town to town with people trying to kill him. So in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27, he says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. It was minus one because if you gave someone 40 lashes and they died, that was murder. 39 was okay, that was an acceptable punishment. But 40 was where they drew the line. So he experienced that five times. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. When he says on the move, he means running from his life, for his life, from, from city to city. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. What Paul doing there, he's processing his trauma right? He's talking about it. He's telling the Corinthians about it. He's certainly not boasting, right? And that's what gets misunderstood sometimes. He's certainly not boasting, but he's trying to process what he has been through. And so in doing that, he's sharing it with those that he trusts. In 2 Corinthians 1.8, he said, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. So when he says, far beyond our ability to endure, he's defining trauma itself. That's how the field defines trauma. Um, it's, it's that we're facing something that we don't have the ability to even cope with, All right? and it brought him to the point of being suicidal. And it may have had that impact on some of you and you may not have even realized that that's what you were struggling with. But he's also challenging a myth there, right? Because one of the myths that we sometimes hear is that God won't give you more than you can face, right? And there Paul is saying, no, we certainly had more than we could face. We had more than we could cope with. God gave us more than we could cope with. And that's the truth. So when we look at the myths that we deal with, the myths that keep us from processing our pain, one of them, like I said, God won't give you more than you can handle. People will say that, but the Bible doesn't say that. He does give us more than we can handle because he wants us to turn to him and come into his loving arms, right? That, so it's absolutely not true. If he never gave us more than we can handle, then we would not need him. But we do need him just for that very reason. He gives us more than we can handle alone. He doesn't give us more than we can handle with him, but we've got to invite him into our lives. And we've got to invite him into that room. We've got to unlock that room right? If I'm going to invite him into my house, it includes that room. He and I need to go into that room together, and we need to heal that wound. Time heals all wounds. There's another myth people will say, especially if you've just lost somebody, right? They're trying to be helpful. They're trying to soothe you and comfort you in some way. They'll say, just give it time. Time heals all wounds. Well, Scripture doesn't tell me that. And it's absolutely not true. 
Time heals nothing. And in fact, the more time that passes without a wound receiving any attention, the more likely it is to become infected. And when it's a core wound, a heart wound, it then infects everything that we do, every decision we make, everything that we are. And third, many people have traumas worse than mine, so I should just move on. Well, as I've already said, we can't compare traumas. I hear that from veterans that have been in combat. Yeah, I was in combat, but I know of some other veteran friends of mine that had it even worse than I do. That's why it took me so long to come for help. No, we cannot compare traumas. We just seek God for healing from it. Because I don't heal by looking around at others. I heal by looking inward. My traumas, my soul wounds are uniquely mine based on my experiences and my reactions to them. They are a part of my story, and it's a story that only I can write with God's loving guidance. And my battle is with the powers of this dark world, right? That's what Ephesians 6, 12, and 18 comes, tells us. We're not battling with each other. We're battling with the powers of this dark world, We're battling with the lies of the enemy. He comes to lie, steal, and destroy. And when we refuse to face the lies that he has planted in our minds, when we try to shove them under the rug, we try to lock them in that room, we're allowing him to get away with that. We're allowing him to steal and kill and destroy from us. We can't do that anymore. Because when my needs were not met in my life, the enemy told me things and I made agreements with those things. I said, maybe you're right. I said, maybe I am unworthy of love. That might ring a bell for some of you. Maybe you said, I'm not enough. I'm broken, bad, or flawed. I'm not really competent, so I don't deserve respect. If people really knew me, they'd leave me. Lies, lies that we might have made agreements with. If any of those kind of tug at your heart, that might be a lie that you have made an agreement with in your life, and you need God's love to help you heal from that. We also need to prayerfully take it to God, and this is where I will ask Miss Andrea to step in. Some people have asked, why should I pray now that the drama has happened? Now that the trauma, the trial, the challenge, now that it's happened, what's the point? God didn't show up. He didn't prevent it. So why pray? I'll be dealing with it for the rest of my life. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can say. God's not going to do anything. He already hasn't done anything. Why would he start now? No. I refuse to believe that. You cannot tell me the God that created you cannot come in and take what the enemy has stolen and he cannot restore it to the way it was originally created. I refuse to believe that. I've seen it in my life. I have seen it in my family's life. And I'm telling you right now, if you believe it, you're believing a lie. And you deserve to be told the truth. You don't have to believe it. You can choose to stand on the truth, which is the word of God. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26. With men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Do you believe in God? You're here. Are you a Christian? Do you believe in him? Then why don't you believe this? It's as easy as believing it. It's not easy going through it. It's not easy identifying it. It's not easy looking into the face and saying, I'm fixing to walk through it. I need help. I need prayer. But I'm going to look at it and I'm going to address it because I will not live the rest of my life bound up by something that the enemy wants to take me down with. I don't have to do it and I'm not going to do it. It is your choice. It becomes on you. Why are you putting up with it? You don't have to. He just told us that we don't have to do it. So you prayerfully take it to God. If you think having uncomfortable conversations about it are hard, wait until you don't have the conversations and see what happens. 
You know what happens? Avoidance, distraction, denial, excuses, shame, guilt, regret, depression, blame, and repression. Where you push it down and you think it's going to go away, but it doesn't. And everybody in here knows that it doesn't. It comes up in nightmares. It comes up in conversation. There are triggers in a movie. It's everywhere. You cannot escape it. There's no escape except for him. You'll see the scripture in red. This is my life first. This is the anchor that God gave me a couple of years ago when our family was going through something hellacious. Psalm 16, 8, I keep my eyes always on the Lord with him at my right hand. I will not be shaken. That might not sound like much to you, but what that is is faith. I choose to trust God in the middle of the junk. When my husband collapsed in January in the emergency room, they start calling code blue. The Holy Spirit himself started moving. I didn't start crying. I did not get emotional. I didn't scream for help. The Lord literally lifted me up out of that chair and I said, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you cannot have my husband's life. I know that was God. That was not me. My norm is to kind of flip out and start screaming. That's not pretty, but it is what it is. That's another thing you need to be honest. It's all right. God already knows the ugly inside of you. He wants to take it out. Who would want to hold on to that? So when you admit what's going on and you choose to take a stand because he says with him at my right hand I will not be shaken if he's right here what do you have to lose zip zero nothing you have nothing to lose he is the strength he is going to empower you he is the do you know what Jesus means the name Jesus means God saves it's not just your salvation he will save you from the trauma. He will deliver you from the sickness. You don't have to be bound up in it. You have to just make a decision. As much as this stinks, as much as I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it anyway because with God all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You have to lean into your sword, which is the Bible. This is what I stand on. I don't care who likes it. I don't care who disagrees with it. This is where I get my strength. You think I'm bold? I'm not bold. I believe what I read in this word. It's that simple. And it is available to every one of you if you will pick it up and devour it. The most important conversation that you can ever have is prayer. Why? Why? Because when you speak, he listens. When you pray, he moves. When you praise in the middle of it, he wars on your behalf. That's what happened in the emergency room. There was nothing to praise God about. We didn't know if Larry was fixing to die. But we chose, me and Reagan both were laying hands on Larry and we believed that God could touch him. And here he is. But you can't give up. Don't give up. He will give you victory if you do not give up. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You speak, he listens. Do you see that? You you move first. You ask, you seek, you knock. He will move if you move first. He has the ability to, but he wants participation. He wants interaction. He wants a relationship with us. This isn't just one-sided. He didn't create dummies. He didn't create robots. He wants a relationship with us. And he finds you worthy. He wouldn't have come if he didn't. But he did. Regardless of how I think, what I feel, I will not bow, I will not bend my knee, I will not break, and I will not be shaken under pressure. I am unrelenting in my decision to seek God because I trust him. And because I trust him, I will not quit. That, again, I want to reiterate to you, that doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that any of this stuff is going to be easy. It just means with the creator's strength, with the all-powerful God, there is strength that surpasses anything you have to offer. And when you have that backing you up, you will be able to succeed. Nothing can change your past. Nothing can change what happened. But we sing about him, Jehovah Rapha. That means the Lord, our healer. Jehovah Rapha wants to give you healing In most cases, the healing is not instantaneous. It's not a miracle. It is a process. That's something that stinks, especially in our culture where we want the instant gratification. But you need to know that that's why he gives us fruit of the Spirit. 
perseverance. That's why he helps us, because he knows that it's going to take patience. It's going to build faith. It's going to produce joy in the end. And let me give you an example. John 11, 21 and 22. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. But I know that even now, whew, I know that even now with him dead for four days, God will give you anything that you ask. See, Martha and Mary had already sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick and Jesus did not come until he had been dead for four days. The trauma happened in spite of them calling on Jesus. But that was not the end of the story. Praise God, that's not the end of the story. Just because something's happened, that is not the end of the story. Amen. Healing occurred after the hurt, after the pain, after the grief, because trauma, trials, and death do not get the final say. Amen. No power whatsoever. Trauma is a stronghold that keeps us in prison until we boldly and courageously ask, which is prayer, you ask God to come in and take it. So how do we do that? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example. Thank you, Pastor Jason, for teaching me this verse. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. What does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. What is Jesus doing right this minute? Romans 8, 34 tells us what he's doing right this very minute at 12 o'clock on the nose. He is also at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Guess what? Intercession is prayer. He's praying for you right now. Amen. If we follow if we follow the example that Jesus set for us, we are to pray because he showed us how to do it. Think about him on the cross. He's still talking to God. He hasn't stopped. He endures the cross for the joy that is set before him. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those that are crushed in spirit. He is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere at the same time, and he does not leave us. He does not plan to leave us. Get used to it. He's got a parking spot with his name on it. He's not going anywhere. You do not ever have to feel forsaken. It doesn't matter if a human being affirms you or not. It ain't about a human being. They are not your source of supply. They are not your comforter. Only God can fill those shoes. Amen. Amen. Psalm 18, 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. He is my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn or strength of my salvation, my stronghold. That is, the, that is God's name, Jehovah Nissi, which means he fights for you. He is your deliverer. You can put faith in God, whereas you may or may not can put trust in human beings. A lot of times we equate God with humans, but you cannot equate the creator with the creation. He is not on the same par as we are. That is where the enemy comes in and dements the way that we think. And he will, your, your, your family doesn't care, God doesn't care. No, that's not true at all. He is above everything. James 1.6 says, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. When the enemy is pushing his very hardest, you're at a crossroads and you must make a choice. You can give up and resign yourself that this is how it's going to be. I'm just going to have to deal with it and find some coping mechanisms. There's no hope. There's no way out. This is just, this is me. Or you can stand your ground and refuse to be moved, which is my scripture again in the red. I refuse to move. Why? Because you know that standing in a position of faith is where God wants you to be so that when you're out of the way, standing and watching, he can move. Think about Moses with the Red Sea. God told him to lift the staff and watch. Behold his mighty hand. Look what God did. Moses couldn't do, neither could us. Nobody can do anything with that water and God parted it because Moses stood in faith and he chose. He chose he made a decision to believe God. Same applies to us. Do you choose God or do you not? I understand that this may be a little pointed. But all I can tell you is this is what the Holy Spirit gave me. And it doesn't just apply to you. I get to deal with it too. But it becomes, do you want it or not? Do you want freedom? Do you not? Get in your prayer closet. 
cry the ugly tears, get out the tissues, get your journal, whatever you need to do, and just lean on the Lord because he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Ever-present, and he never leaves. His words are true, and he is not going to back off. You want to, he wants you to persevere, but he also perseveres. He is That's why they call him faithful and true. He is faithful. He does not relent. He does not give up what is his, which is you and I. I'm almost done. Regarding difficult situations where you feel trapped or you've struggled for a long time and you feel hopeless, you have to take a bold stance of faith and stand still. You have to take it and say, no matter what comes, I choose you, Lord. I'm going to just make a choice. Larry could have died that day in the emergency room. I'm very well aware of that. And I told the Lord, I said, if this is your time, if this is how you're going to take him, I will somehow, some way need y'all's help and prayers, but I will somehow, some way get through this. But if it is not, I take it back in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to just stand here and watch the enemy come into my house and steal something that is not his. I will not be shaken. And you do not have to be shaken either. You do not have to be shaken. Make a decision that you are not going to give any more leeway to the enemy. You are going to hand it over and say, God, I need you to take it. Will you help me? And his answer is yes, I'm already there. So if I put you to sleep, she just woke you up. So um, I got a, uh, a video clip from a friend this week, m- messaged it to me, and in this video clip, it was an interesting situation that was being faced. It was two lawyers, they were in, I know that makes it sound like I'm setting up for a joke, right? But this is not, definitely not a joke, but they were, they were it, was a, it was a lawyer speaking, and he had been um, in Alaska tr- working on a case. And he had a flight to Anchorage on his way back to the States, but he was approached by a pastor, actually, who said, hey, I've got a private plane. Why don't you get your money back on your ticket and fly with us on this private plane? And against his better judgment, he agreed. So, both, so he sits on the right side of the plane, and the other lawyer sits in the back, his, his buddy. And they get up into the clouds, and the pilot actually passes out. Again, I'm sure this sounds like a joke, but I'm, I'm assuring you, this is not a joke. This was a real event that this individual was describing. And so the pilot passes out. Both of them know, they have no idea how to fly a plane. Um, so the, the individual that's the speaker, he says, well, I saw that there was a radio, so I handed a microphone to uh, my buddy behind me, and, and I said, just start asking for help. So he starts saying, hello, 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 because they didn't know anything about radio um, etiquette or anything. They were just saying hello. And, and somebody picked up and said, and they told them the situation. We're in this plane. We have no idea how to fly it. We can't even see. We're in the clouds. And, uh, and what do we do? And the guy said, I'm going to transfer you to Alaska emergency and, um, and they may be able to help you. So finally, a few minutes later, Alaska emergency comes on the radio. And the individual says, I'm, I can talk you through this. You're, you're about four minutes from a mountain that you're about to crash into. He said, because even though you can't see me, I can see you. You can't see me, but I can see you. So if you will just listen to my voice, I'm going to be able to get you home. You can't listen to the other voices in your head. You can't focus on the storm. You're heading into a storm as well, and I'm going to get you through that storm, but only if you don't focus on that storm. I need you to focus on nothing but my voice. Obey my voice, and I will get you home. And they did. And as they start approaching Alaska, he got around the mountain, he got through the storm, and then they start approaching Alaska, they start approaching Anchorage, and he says, okay, you're coming close to the airport now. 
The way you'll know where to land is there are lights that are in the shape of a cross. At the, Ala at the Anchorage airport, there are lights in the shape of a cross, and that's where you need to land. If you land at the foot of the cross, you will live. Right. He talked him down. He said, I landed that airplane. I, in fact, I landed it about seven times, but finally it did come to a stop. And he lived, and the, and the voice said, thank you for listening to my voice. He said, so many times people do not listen to my voice. They listen to the other voices in their heads. They focus on the storm, and I lose them. Thank you for just listening to my voice. It's, it just r reminds me so much of Peter getting out of that boat, right? God didn't say that he made human beings to be able to walk on water, but Jesus said, if you will just stay focused on me, you are going to walk on water. And he did until he took his eyes off of Jesus. And Jesus said, ye of little faith, why did you take your eyes off me? Why did you stop believing? And Jesus is saying that to us too. Hey, I, I can have you walking on water. I can get you through this storm if you will just listen to my voice. Stop listening to those other voices in your head. I came across the story of Dr. Ellie Stevens in preparing for this message. Dr. Ellie Stevens is a psychiatrist who experienced multiple traumatic experiences in her life from unspeakable abuses to a fall from a cliff and head injury that left her unable to function for many months. Here on this slide, she describes how she turned to God for his healing power in her life. She said, there were several points at which I felt him comfort me and I felt his love at a deeper level than I've ever felt before. At one point I heard him say, why are you blocking my love? Why are you blocking my love? And I just started bawling because I was blocking him out. I was blocking his love. I was the one keeping distance because of my shame and doubt, thinking I don't deserve this but that's the point of grace. She said the first step was acknowledging and asking for it because if we seek, we'll find. Like Miss Andrea said, step nearer to me and I will step nearer to you. If we seek, we'll find. It's up to us first, right? We have to take those first steps. We have to come closer to God. We have to ask him into our house, and we have to tell him about that room and ask him to come into the room with us to resolve the issue there. We have to ask, but if we ask, we will receive. In my journey, there were times I said, I can't hold on, but I kept going, and he came through. And John 15, 7 supports her experience. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, right? If you'll just listen to my voice, just listen to my voice, just obey my voice, not the storm, not the other voices in your head. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for what you desire and it will be done for you. The last point that we need to make, the last point in your journey towards healing and more freedom in your life towards a better act three is to pursue purpose in the pain. After years of prayer and faith, Dr. Stevens was finally able to say, help me to use this trauma for your glory and not waste it. When we arrive at the other side of the pain, 
Or maybe sometimes when we're even still in it, we can praise God for taking us through it to where there is freedom and healing. Then our eyes will be open to see how we may be able to use the trauma for his glory. Not only will our faith be stronger, we will be stronger and more capable of empathizing with the pain of others. Having come through the fire, we can reach in and help to pull others through the fire as well. Because part of God's will for your life is that you help people, not just through your gifts and strengths, but also through your pain. My life scripture, James 1, 2 through 4. It's a constant reminder to me that whatever battles I might be fighting, my heavenly Father is fighting alongside me and wants me to emerge victorious with a deeper knowing of him and of his love. I may not feel happy going through the storm. It may not feel like joy when in the midst of the fight, but joy comes in the morning. Purposes of pain. Pain is an opportunity for you to see how strong you are, and in Christ you're stronger than you think, and there's joy in that. Pain builds your endurance, allowing you to persevere through life's trials. Pain matures you, and maturity helps you see the world differently. Pain teaches you what what pleasure never could. Completeness is a deeper understanding of life and how to navigate its challenges. It gives you everything you need so that not lacking anything, you turn to God in humility and surrender, and in him you discover hope. And pain connects us with others. And this world needs connectedness today more than ever. I looked up statistics this week and found that our suicide rate today in the United States is higher than it's been in 80 years. Now, you may have your own thoughts on why that may be, but to me, it comes down to connectedness. We're not connected. We're not sharing our lives with each other. We're isolated. We're divisive. We're distance. We're canceling. We're canceling people instead of loving people and embracing people. We need that connectedness in this world. And pain connects us. Pain connects us like nothing else will because we all have it. Isaiah eight fifty eight, For my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. So we may not understand why we had to go through our trials. I get that. But we still need to have faith and know that he is Lord and that he wants us to live life more abundantly. I know this can be really difficult when you're in the midst of the struggle, right? When you're in the battle, it can be hard to see, as I said earlier, that anything good can come out of this. And in our own humanly ways, nothing probably could, but in God, all things are possible. And he wants the best for you. So we've given you three P's in your process towards healing and greater freedom. Healing from trauma, healing from trials, healing from those wounds that you've carried with you your whole life. We've talked about process the pain. We've talked about prayerfully taking it to God. And we've talked about pursuing a purpose in that pain. I want to add one more P to that. I'm interrupting you. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I want to add one more P to this list, and it's praise in the storm. I will praise specifically in the storm, in the trauma, or in the pain, because God wants us to stay in permanent positions of praise. Why? Because it confounds the enemy. It doesn't make any sense when you praise God when everything sucks. It doesn't, so do it anyway. Worship team, can we get you to go ahead and come up here as we're closing? Thank you. And you remember that when I started speaking, I talked about Romans 8, 28 as something that people can just throw out there to try to comfort you through your pain, right? 
Well, what is our hope in pain? It's the promise of God that he can bring good out of anything, even pain, if we trust him. Circling back to Romans 8, 28, then to know that in all things, that includes our traumas, our trials, and our tribulations. God works for the good, for the good of those who love him. And that's truth. And that truth will set you free. But this is not a trite platitude to quickly make someone feel better about the struggle. It's a treasure to be arrived at eventually through our journey, through our processing and sharing, through our prayer and asking and pleading and inviting, and through our pursuit of purpose in our pain, finding ways of coping and using it for the benefit of others, for that connection to other people. And again, our prayer is just that some of this meant something to somebody, and that because this meant something to you, you will invite God into your house and into that room, and you will finally face that wound that you've been afraid to face.